Hi, I'm Michael Prettyman, one of your pastors here at GraceWorks Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Our desire at GraceWorks Church is to know Him and make Him known. If you're at GraceWorks Church for any amount of time, you'll hear these three words, know, grow, and go. Simply stated, know means knowing God. Grow means growing in a relationship with God and other believers. And go means go and telling others about God and serving others for God. Today, I quickly want to tell you some things that we do at GraceWorks Church in the word grow. We practice growing at GraceWorks Church through what we call life groups. We call them life groups because these are small groups of ideally and approximately no more than 12 people that simply do life together. Our life groups gather on different days at different times of the day and with different frequency. Some of our life groups gather once a week and some twice a month. The time and frequency is up to the schedule of the individuals in the life group. When the life groups meet, there is an intentional time of discussing scripture and prayer. Each life group is unique. We have a life group that does book studies. We have a life group that does Bible trivia. And we have several life groups that gather and fellowship and just break bread together. In these life groups, we're able to have a deeper relationship with one another, sometimes sharing things like private health battles, or more personal needs, as well as times of celebration and praise together. Although it's wonderful and encouraging to be able to come together as the entire church body, it's difficult and practically impossible to have a personal relationship with every person in the entire congregation. And sometimes the loneliest place in the world is in the middle of a large crowd. Pastor Tony and Pastor Bill have been and will continue to be very intentional about trying to have everyone at GraceWorks Church in a life group. So, although we have several life groups, we plan to start some more life groups. If you want to know more about life groups, please see Pastor Tony, Pastor Bill, or myself, and we can tell you how to be a part of one or maybe even host one in your own home, at the church, or like our trivia group does, going from restaurant to restaurant. Today, we talked about the word grow in our know, grow, and go statement. And next week, we'll talk about the word go. Thanks for listening, and I hope that you have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. I don't know about you, but I think that should count for at least 10 minutes of Tony's sermon. <laughs> Shorten it, buddy. Shorten it. Hey, welcome, everybody. It's good to have you in uh, church today and worshiping with us. And we're excited, you know, as we come to the end of the year, rather than mourning the passing of a year or whatever, we're excited about a new beginning. It's like having a grandchild. Or a child. And we've got some grandchildren who are here today visiting with us, so it's always fun in the summertime to welcome your grandchildren, uh, not so much your children, but your grandchildren back home and, and, and so forth. So we are delighted that you're here with us. You know, I, I want to take just a moment as we begin this worship service today and acknowledge that what we have right here is a privilege that is denied to many people around the world the right to gather to worship God according to what the beliefs of our heart are. And to know that we can go and get in our cars and not have to worry about being shot or arrested for our religious beliefs. And it so happens that today is the anniversary of the death of five men who represent the sacrifice of men and women around the globe. So I want us to pause for just a few seconds as we remember the fallen five.
Heavenly Father, your son gave his life on the cross. Sometimes, as we present the cause of freedom and Christianity, we too are called to sacrifice. Not usually with our lives, but in other ways. God, empower us to quit grumbling and complaining and refusing. Let us step up and do that which brings glory to your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for the men who gave their lives, and today we pray especially for their families, that they would have peace, joy, and an awareness of your presence. Now lead us as we worship you in Christ's name.
Thank you, Tani, for singing that. And I saw a lot of you guys singing along with that this morning. So uh, thank you for singing with us. And that's what we're going to continue doing here in a moment. We're just going to sing about the goodness of God. He is good. And the reason we're here is to worship him this morning and to please him this morning. And in the meantime, we, we're encouraged as well coming together. So welcome to Grace Works Church and welcome to our Facebook Live audience who's uh, watching online there. Glad that you're here with us this morning. It's a nice, cool day here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, if you're on Facebook Live. Uh, now, it's very hot and muggy. It is mid-July, and uh, uh, it just is what it is. That's what happens in Chattanooga in mid-July. <laughs> but I'm so glad that you guys are here, and praise the Lord, we have air conditioning, so all is well. But I'm going to go ahead and ask you to stand up right now, if you will, and get out there in the aisles and find somebody this morning that you have not had a chance to find yet this morning. Tell them, welcome to Grace Works Church. Now, you can get out of your seat and get in the aisles, go all over the room, and make sure you greet somebody, maybe somebody you don't get to see every Sunday morning. And again, just say, welcome to Grace Works Church. We'll sing some songs here in a moment. Let's sing this together. I say I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, I was sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me. Now sing, am I as love lifted me? Complete, they say. Continue singing. Yeah, 
You know, I love hearing Pat playing that piano back there. Sounds so good. Y'all help us sing the song this morning, Cornerstone, Christ Alone, Our Cornerstone.
you give the Lord a clap offering this morning. <laughs> Great singing, guys. And you guys can go ahead and grab a seat right now. We're going to have a time for scripture reading. When summertime hits Chattanooga, it's time for the church to think about a new beginning with a new church year. And always we need workers. I don't want to disappoint you, but the most difficult assignment has already been taken. Jesus died on the cross. Whatever you do will be almost nothing compared to what he did for you. So as we begin this time, I want you to think about how you can serve God through the ministries of Grace Works Church, whether you are a member, a regular guest, or a first-time visitor, we invite you to share the kingdom's work. The mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons. Kneeling down, she asked a favor of him. He asked, what is it you want? She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and one at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup that I am going to drink? We can, she answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Even Jesus submitted to the role where God could best use him. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be the first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Would you guys give me just a second to explain, because some of you guys hear this every single Sunday, but this is a time that we come to in the service. And some of you may be your first time, but it's a time for us to just have a, take some alone time and pray and talk to the Lord. I, when I grew up uh, going to church, um, uh, we were always very deliberate about prayer time, but there have been times that I've been in services we get going through, and I have service orders up here that I just get going through, and we kind of start just punching things off the checklist, and uh, and we miss out sometimes. And this time right here is reserved for us to be able to just make an altar right where you are and thank the Lord for something this morning. I, I, on my, my sheet, it's called the prayer chorus. But it's a time specifically to be thankful. So right now, if you take a moment just to bow your heads and close your eyes, we're going to take about a half a minute, 30 seconds or so, just to talk to the Lord and thank Him for something this morning. Don't miss this opportunity. In the morning when I rise, oh, in the morning when I rise, oh, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give 
to die Oh, when I come to die Give me Jesus Give me God, we thank you that we can come here this morning, that we can talk to you, that we can gather in your name. God, we thank you for this beautiful facility and this beautiful campus that we're able to meet. God, that we're able to encourage each other. But God, as we're here this morning, I pray most of all that we are encouraging you with these songs that we sing about you, the songs that we sing for you as we sing about the goodness of God. And God, we thank you as we just prayed, give me Jesus, God, that you gave us Jesus. So what a privilege it is for me to speak on behalf of every person in this room right now and I tell you that we love you and we thank you for the gift of salvation that we have only through Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. I want to offer my welcome to each one of you and especially our guests. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate your presence here today. For the past five years, I've been investing in a relationship with my neighbor across the street. My neighbor, he's a little bit older than me. He's a lot shorter than me. And my family laugh when we talk about my neighbor because when I arrive at home and go into the garage without the door being closed, I hear, Tony, Tony. That's the way he sounds. And my neighbor will start running across the yard into the street. And most of our relationship is built right out in the middle of the street. And one of the subjects that always comes up in the middle of the street is our yards, our grass. And he will usually compliment my grass and say how great it is, how much effort I put into it, to which I go, yeah, it does look good. And then I look at his yard. Oh, his yard is, he has scalped it. It's full of weeds. And I go, you've got the most improved yard in the neighborhood. You're going to be the one the association votes to put the sign, best, most improved. And multiple times I've heard my neighbor say, well, I only do 70 to 80%. And he kind of laughs at it. And he says, there's room for improvement then. 70 to 80 percent. Are you satisfied with 70 to 80 percent effort? 
in regards to your faith, your walk with Christ? Are you pleased with 70 to 80 percent of effort put in by your church, his church? I want to share something with you. If 70 to 80 percent is not enough, what is the standard for greatness within the church, within our life, our walk with Christ? Is 90 percent a good number? 95? Obviously, we'd like to say 100, but would you settle for 99% effort in your faith? I came across some interesting statistics. This is from the Communications Division of Insight in Canada. And it says, what would be the outcome if 99.9% was our standard? That was our standard which we are pro- that we are pleased with, we're satisfied with, we're content. And listen to these items. If 99.99% was the effort given, the outcome. If 99.99% is the standard, income tax returns. 119,760 of these would be processed incorrectly every year. Now, I'm not going to put in side comments here because obviously the nature of this one. But books, those who are publishing books, if you got only 0.1%, 0.01%, there would be 2,434,300 books this year that would be sent with the wrong cover. And if 99.99% is your standard goal, 110,600 pairs of mismatched shoes would be shipped this year. And it gets serious. If that's your goal, two planes daily at O'Hare Airport in Chicago would be unsafe. Are you content with that? Are you satisfied? And if that's your goal, 810 commercial airline flights would crash every month. And this is where it starts really getting our attention. If we're only settling for 99%, there would be 144 incorrect medical procedures today. Or, excuse me, yeah, daily. 144 incorrect procedures. And if that's our goal, each day, 18 babies would be given to the wrong parents. 99%. If that's your goal, if you're satisfied with that, this is some of the things that could take place in the world. But what about in your walk with Christ? If that was your goal, what if our goal is a church and serving was only 99%? And we say, that's good. But the passage that Brother Bill read earlier, it speaks about the pursuit of greatness. And what would greatness be in our walk with Christ? What would greatness be as a church? Would it be 99% effort? Would it be more? In the passage we just heard, it speaks about the brothers James and John and their mother. And in this passage, there's a request made by the mom. She says, allow my son James and John to sit at your right, your left, in a position of authority, a privileged position when you're reigning for eternity. Before we get upset with them for being so arrogant, before we get upset with them, how in the world could they make that decision? May we all consider the fact that we're all born with a desire for greatness. We're all born with this idea within us that we want greatness. We want others to see that in us. And here they're asking for greatness. We're born with that desire. They were born with this desire. Nobody wants to be called a loser. We don't go through life saying, hey, I want to be a loser at my job. I want everybody to look at me and say, you're the worst. 
How many of us want to have the attitude and label of being a loser in our relationships with spouses, with family members, with church members? Man, you're terrible. You're a loser. No, no one wants that. We have a desire for success. We desire for greatness. And Jesus, as these uh, two sons, mother, approach him, having a position of authority, privilege, he says, are you able to drink of my cup? What is a cup? Obviously, I'm thinking about a coffee cup. But in the Old, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew culture, a cup was symbolic of your fate, your future. And the future, this future, We see the idea that greatness is going to come with suffering, not ease. For this cup, describing the fate, it has good and bad connotations to it. If you look at uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he goes on to say, he prepares a banquet for me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil and my cup overflows that's God's goodness being experienced in someone where it overflows but when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane he was praying he was asking the father hey if this if you allow this cup to pass from me it's a pass it's a cup of God's wrath God's wrath on sin there's the positive but there's also the negative. And this is Jesus' fate. This is his future. It's to experience God's wrath on sin placed on him. Jesus says to the brothers, hey, this is my cup. They don't get it. And he says, can you take this? Can you drink of this cup? And of course they say, yes, we can take it. We have the privilege of looking the other side of the cross. They had not, no idea what they were thinking or saying here in this. We can drink. So let's be careful that we uh, place all the fault on uh, James and John for their response. For they didn't realize to being able to drink of Christ's cup, they were minimizing the suffering. And how often do we minimize the suffering of Jesus. Yes, he took on my sins and your sins. But do you realize the, the disgusting nature of our sins? That's what God, where he placed his wrath, his anger, his justice. And so for James and John, they didn't know. But do we know the wrath of God and the impact of his wrath upon sin and on our lives? As we mature and grow in our faith, we begin to grow also in our understanding of sin, the devastating effect it has on us, but also God's wrath, his detest for sin, the weight, the heaviness of that. Achieving greatness in God's kingdom is through suffering. We've already mentioned those who've given their lives. There's an organization called Voices of the Martyr. And very rarely do I see any testimonies in those publications about people from the states. It's people from other nations outside the states. And over and over you read testimonies of families where the, the husband, the father is executed. His life is taken from him or he's beaten. And yet the family continues to love God, serve God, and share God. Or what about the person in one of the African countries that is taken, imprisoned, beaten, disfigured, and yet when they're released, guess what they do? They go back to sharing the gospel just like they did before. The, here's great examples of achieving greatness in the kingdom of God. There you find suffering. If we're following him, expect suffering. And yet, we've already heard the request for those 
of the Grace Works family to serve? Where is my role in this congregation? Ways I can serve within the family, but also outside the walls in our community. How will you respond when you're given the opportunity to serve? Sometimes our response is not favorable. Well, that's not me. I don't have those talents. When we weigh the cost and go, oh, that's going to put me in an awkward place. Well, it was an awkward place for Jesus when he hung on the cross. It was out of his comfort zone to suffer. Will we suffer? For greatness, it comes with suffering, not ease. And to share in his mission is also to share in his cost. Jesus told James and John, you can't drink this cup, but you're going to experience it. Once I leave, you're going to experience what I'm experiencing, the suffering for the kingdom of God. Well, I always find the humorous in Scripture. And here I kind of laugh a little bit when they, these two have pursued greatness, wanted greatness with Christ. He somewhat turned them down. And over here, you got these other ten. And they are ticked off. It says indignant, but I'm no, I don't use that word. But they're upset. How dare they ask for that place? Why? Because I want that place next to Christ. Here you, you see Jesus kind of refocus the group. And he said, this is what the world does. And this is my kingdom. And here you see there's a difference. The measurement for defining greatness, it may not be exactly what you think it is. Unfortunately, sometimes we bring the world's standard and measurement into the life of the church. Success. Success in a church is big buildings. Success, it's a lot of money coming in on Sundays. Success is how many people you can put in a room on Sunday mornings. That is somewhat the world's idea, standard of greatness. But here Jesus says, those leaders, those rulers, they lord over their authority. They exercise their authority. They are there to be served, not to serve. When we come to the life of the church and we pursue greatness as a church family, as we pursue this with grace works, sometimes you can see these examples in when we don't consult God as to the direction. Or if we don't seek his, or we ask his approval of whatever it is, that's not the question to ask. The question is, where do you want to lead us? What is it, God, that you want? Not offering up our plans and saying, God, bless my plans. This is what I'm doing for you. No, God, what do you want? And how can I be a part of it? How can I take part in this? Greatness is counted not in the number that are serving us. It's in the number that we serve. It's not in the number of people that are, that are reaching out to us, making us the focus. But it's actually when we give and focus on the others. That is truly greatness in God's kingdom. Knowing what the request and what the heart of the disciples was, Jesus points to him. He said, greatness it's about being a servant, not being the master, not being the ruler, but it's about being a servant. And the evidence of this is none other than seen in the life of Christ, how he fulfills his purpose when he came to serve, when he came to give his life as a ransom. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, it says, knowing that you were ransomed from the put all ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Jesus, he offered himself up 
not with money to pay for the price for our souls, but he offered up his blood. He offered up himself so that we might be set free from sin, the consequences of sin. He offered up his self so that we might not die eternally. So, we've been presenting the idea of why should we serve. It's not out of obligation. It's not out of nobody else will do it. I'll fill in. But notice, the reason we serve is it provides a witness of the one that we know. The greatest. It's a response and it's a witness and a testimony to the world. This is who Christ is. This is what he's done. And we're following his example to serve, not to be served. But why should we? The service, it's a response to his expression of love. We sing about his love all the time. He loves us so much. He gave his life for us. What do we do with that? We respond in like manner and follow his example of service, of giving of oneself. For the next six weeks, you're going to be invited to serve at Grace Works. Primarily, it will be within the church. We have what we call ministry teams. And these ministry teams have specific responsibilities using talents, gifts, abilities, passions. And these are not to be done out of obligation. It's not because this is what you do when you go to Grace Works, when you're part of the family. No, this is because we're responding to God loving us. And we're moved by His love for us. And it's, it's the fact that when others see us, whether it's the world or we see one another serving, we're proving a testimony of who he is and what he means to us. Whether we realize it or not, each one of us are being served at this very moment. We're being served because he died for us and he made salvation possible in the opportunity the privilege to walk with him daily you and I are the beneficiaries of Christ serving others and serving us and so he is worthy to be lifted up he is worthy to be put in the spotlight through our service through our life through our witness Jesus provided an example for us and his example should become our mission. As we know him, as we experience him, as we witness him, this is going to be our response, our mission. And Jesus, he's the example for us of one who is selfless. It's one that serves for the sake of others. His life when he came, his life was giving of himself, and it enabled him to love, serve us. It enables us to love and serve others, not self. To serve is not to be recognized. To serve is for the benefits of others. And sometimes it requires that we it definitely place effort on being selfless. But it also... As you look at his life, you see the sacrifice. And this should be our mission as well. Willing to give up our rights for someone else. Give up the place that we sit. The place of honor. The witness. We're willing to give up for the sake of others. How far will we go? Will we give 70 to 80% sacrifice? And we give all that we have. But Jesus also placed an example for us of salvation. In his life, he provided an example for us. He provided the salvation. The salvation that we as followers of Christ place our faith in. And obviously we are not called to be the providers of salvation in that it's our shed blood. But we're to carry the gospel out. To make salvation known. 
to make salvation possible only through Jesus Christ. That's the reason we serve. There's a ad, there's t-shirts for the Marines. It uses the saying, earned, not given. It's an idea, an attitude that respect, place of honor, it's earned, it's not given. This is also used within messages, being communicator. I often use this idea, you have to earn the right to be heard. You need to treat people a certain way in order for them to give you their attention. But Jesus in his kingdom, things are reversed. To be greatest, here you see you have to give in order to earn. And Jesus gave through his example. He gave his life. You and I didn't earn it. He gave it. Jesus, he shed his blood. It says he came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom. The idea of ransom in our 21st century is usually attributed or attached to the idea of someone who has been kidnapped in prison. And you pay a ransom. Very similar in the Bible. It's the idea of setting someone free. And if the payment is not met, if the payment is not given for a slave, then they will be executed. They will, be, they will experience death. For you and I, we're, we're bound by sin. And Jesus, he paid the price. He paid the ransom with his very life. And we've been set free by his shed blood. And the only way that we can experience the, the privilege, the opportunity of being set free is to trust in him. That's what salvation is about. That's what is, that's our eternal destination's means. is by trusting in his ransom, his payment that he pray, played paid for all of us are you trusting in that today are you trust trusting in the fact you're earning your salvation we serve not to earn our salvation we serve because he first served us and he continues to serve us would you join me as we pray together father in heaven we pause right now and we ask you to give us a glimpse of the ugliness of our sin. Father, give us a glimpse of our need for the shed blood of Jesus. Father, open up our eyes to see the great work of Christ on the cross, the grave, that makes it possible for us to experience eternal life. Father, open our eyes up to see how we need to serve as we respond to your service for us. Father, open up our eyes. Father, I, we thank you that we get to gather here. But Father, it's not about just attending. It's about serving. And Father, I pray for your church at Grace Works that we would be the greatest. All because we serve you and we serve others. Father, I pray for each believer in this room that they would be great in your kingdom. Not because of their reputation, not because of their talents, Father, but because of their service. They're serving. And others have the privilege to see you through this service. Father, I pray that you'd open up our eyes. Help us to gr grasp your glory. And Father, thank you so much for giving your son Jesus. Thank you 
fact that you are serving us. We love you. We love you. We give thanks. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Serving is about responding to who Christ is, what he's done. Worship is about responding to who Christ, who God is, and what we mean to him. We respond this morning in song and prayer, commitment. This is your time to respond with commitment, with singing, and with prayer. Brother Bill and I will be down here at the front to worship with you. But we also be here to share with you and your commitment to share with this decision to respond in an appropriate manner. Church, may we see, may we see the need. May we see where we're absent in our responding to Him. May God open up our eyes. We will be here if you've never experienced God's saving blood. This is your time. This is your opportunity to respond. And you may be a believer and you say, I'm not part of this church, but I want to be part of this family that serve together, that serve others. We will be here. We will be glad to share with you, to share you with the church family. Whatever your decision, whatever your commitment, whatever your response, this is for each one of us and for us as a congregation. Don't miss this opportunity. Would you stand as we respond and may we worship. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Listen to that verse again. My hope is built on nothing less. Say this with me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, say Christ alone, cornerstone, no weak man strong in the same. with me one more time. Christ alone. Say Christ alone. Say our cornerstone. A weak may strong in the Savior's love and through the storm. He is alone. may be seated for just a minute. I want to say again, guests, thank you for being here. You don't know how important, how valuable you are to us as a church, so thank you so much. We hope that you'll come back so that we can get to know you better and possibly become a part of this family of faith known as Grace Works. It's a great church. Why? Because we're serving together. We're happy here because we love one another, not because we're perfect. And 70 to 80 percent, may that not be our goal. May we always be striving. May we never be content or satisfied with how we are serving and the difference we're making in this community. May we continue out of motivation for Christ because of his love, his blood for us. May God bless each one of us. May he open up our eyes to see how important his blood that was shed for us is. 
And may he open up our eyes, our hearts, to see how much of ourselves are we giving and serving. May God bless each one of you this morning. And may he bless you this week as you go out, not to serve self, but may you serve others. May you take the opportunities this week for the sake of someone else and not for self-glory. God's blessings on each of you. Well, it's good, once again, good to see all you guys here today. And, you know, as I get to my final announcement, you know, I'm reminded of we have so much to be thankful for. And one thing that I want to remember and I want to thank God for right now and remind everybody of to kind of always keep in the front of our mind as I'm getting ready to make our announcement about our giving and everything else as we go out the door. You know, just a year and a half, two years ago, we were over a million and a half dollars in debt. In debt and today we are debt free. I, I can't believe that still to this day. Praise the Lord. Uh, I just was thinking about that a second ago. I was thinking about the fireworks show and we sent the mortgage, the retired mortgage debt off on the first bottle rocket that went up. It was, it's just a blessing. And sometimes we can forget where we were, but praise the Lord where we are. And I'm going to go ahead and ask you guys to go ahead and stand up right now. And I'm going to go out. And I was thinking about that as I was thinking my last announcement that I always give as you go out the door this morning, if you brought an offering this morning, if you brought an offering gift this morning, as you go out the door, offering box are in the back so be sure to drop that off and uh praise the lord i hope you guys have a wonderful day we're going to sing out with a song here so y'all can sing along with me or you can just walk on out with it god bless you have a great day well i heard an old long story how a savior came from the glory and how he gave his life on calvary to Sing up there the song of victory. Come on now, here you go.